Hello, everyone. We have a very special guest on today's podcast, world famous actor, Bella Ramsey, who's recently overcome a lifelong fear of being sick, known as a metaphobia. Please welcome Bella. Before we start, right, you're going to have to forgive me, Bella, because I only thought, I only thought that I knew you in Game of Thrones and Worst Witch and then this scary zombie thing that I'd never heard of the game before. But I had a little look, right, and I feel bad about this. You've done about 30 films and series. Yeah. You got done... a BAFTA as a child. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you're nominated for about 65 different awards in the last 12 <laughs> months. Yeah, it's been a bit busy. So can we start with that then? Because mm -hmm. I I am more astounded than ever now after Googling you for the first time <laughs> that you managed to beat your emetophobia despite being all over the world filming 30 different films and series and that's just that's bonkers yeah i remember you always saying that to me that was like i can give myself some slack because it is like quite uh, difficult circumstances yeah for me the moments between action and cut were actually when i was at my best emetophobia wise like it was but in that in those moments i was free of metaphobia because i wasn't the characters that i was playing didn't have that and i was just like so focused on, on this one thing that i was doing and being in this this other person's shoes that between action and curtain like on set was when i was at my best really and all my metaphobia stuff on set i just sort of had had to deal with because i didn't have a choice which was good okay um, but but did it plague you on set and um, were you pushing it away the whole time or was it just not there because you just zoned out no, it was definitely there. Um, I was just, I just was like forced to handle it, I guess, because they're, you're fighting the clock all the time and like there isn't really time to like actually let it become anything. Saying that, I did have a, a couple of panic attacks on set, you know, as you do, quietly. Um, uh, yeah, it was still on my mind every day and I would be very conscious about what food I would eat on set and worried about if there was a bug going around or who looked ill and who didn't and if i had to eat like set food like a prop that was food i'd have to, i'd be stressed about that and wanted to make sure they heated it properly and stuff so it was still definitely i was anxious pretty much all the time but um i guess i just yeah the circumstances meant that i had to carry on regardless wow and for the record, how how because I'm 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 gobsmacked that you that you are giving us your time for a start. I know how busy you are, and and that you're devoting this time because I know you want to help other people, right? Mm. And you know how bad that is. But some will think that oh, you know, if she's completely overcome her emetophobia, it could never have been that bad. I do mm. recall it being really bad. But t tell us a little bit about how bad it was. <laughs> There was a point at which I couldn't leave my house, um, like my family home. I couldn't, I couldn't go outside because in my, because everything, there's times when it felt like the, even the air around me was like a threat. Like I was just living in this world of just, when there was just threat everywhere and threat of being sick. Like it's, that was what the threat was. It's not like fear of dying or fear of, I don't know, the normal fears that people have. It was like a fear of, like a pathological fear of that I would get sick, feel sick, see vomit on the street or something. It was so terrifying that like I couldn't leave my house for a while. Um, yeah, it was it was pretty bad. I wouldn't do so many things. There was very odd specific things I wouldn't do. Like I wouldn't go on this particular train because one time I was on that train and I saw someone being sick. So then I, I just wouldn't go on those trains ever again. Or getting on aeroplanes was that was a challenge i mean i had i had to because of work but i would literally get on kicking and screaming and as soon as i was on i would be literally about to get off again um and 
yeah, it was it was pretty bad. It impacted pretty much every area of my life. Presumably, unlike most sufferers, you had to tell your parents because mm. I'm assuming that when you were younger, they had to travel. Well, one of them had to travel with you when you're flying all over the world filming. So one of them must have known. Yes, both of them knew. Um, people generally knew. It was never something that I was particularly embarrassed about or kept a secret. Um, I wasn't just going like telling everyone willy nilly, but like I was, I it was because it was necessary for people to know. I guess, yeah. When did you first know that you had emetophobia? Well, I have one memory when I was a kid of being in nursery and somebody like a small child throwing up like on my crocs my red crocs when I was probably like four or three like three or four but I remember that being funny like I don't remember that being an issue but every single memory that I have that I can recall after that it was scary so like being in primary school and there was a kid who would always like throw up at lunchtime and his <laughs> and it was like pink because he always ate strawberries um that right. used to <clears throat> like that used to scare me being at school like it all I do think the fear got worse though as I got older it definitely got worse like it did not improve oh, with time why do you think why do you think that was <clears throat> um I think you you become smarter and therefore stupider as you get older <laughs> um okay. I don't know I think I just like grew up and then the fears became more real as I got older. And do you think do you think that goes hand in hand with like better safety seeking behaviors that you know the older you get the more intelligent you get the the more you're able to dodge certain situations and manage situations differently which in the moment is great but in the long term just kind of adds to the anxiety doesn't it? Yes, exactly. I think that's what I meant by you get smarter, therefore like stupider in terms of fear, because you think they're like, oh, I'll do this, and then this is going to prevent this, and then this will prevent that, and then that will prevent that. Whereas in reality, you're just like weaving yourself into a web that, you, and none of those things are really actually doing anything, and you're just making it much more difficult for yourself to just go through life and um, experience things and not be afraid all the time. Did did you ever? I'm, I know I've asked you these questions before, and I apologise. <laughs> but did you did you ever? when filming mm -hmm. feel so anxious that you just had to stop or not, not film that day or pass it on or something? No, I never missed a day ever. Um, no matter how bad it was, I never missed a, missed a day. Like I always got to set. I always did it. I always turned up. There was one lunch time where I was like, I took 10 minutes out because I had, I, basically it was like a night shoot i ate my lunch too fast lunch at like okay. one in the morning and then Quite. thought that i was gonna <laughs> i felt really sick and got back to set i started having this full-on panic attack where i sort of lost control of myself and then um someone who was there like thankfully noticed it and we went on like a walk around the back of the set and that was they were like delayed by 10 minutes because I, I just needed to time they're like you can have longer I'm like nope I will go back and you will not be waiting because of me okay. but yeah so so that was the time but I've never no I never missed a day and do you think that's partly because something you said earlier when you when you're acting you're 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 being somebody else aren't you so it's not you mm. you're be, you're yeah. being somebody that doesn't have a metaphobia yeah absolutely it's definitely I'm at my yeah like I'm at my best when I'm filming so the, if I had have missed a day, it would have made it so much worse because then I just would have been alone with all these thoughts and fears and it would have just been, would have been bad. And I also, I didn't miss a day, but I didn't because I was, I knew that people were relying on me. I knew that it would screw up the schedule and I just knew that so many things relied on me being there and that I wasn't going to, no matter how bad my fear was, that was not going to stop me from being, like doing my job and because I knew how it would have affected everybody else if I didn't show up. Forgive, forgive my smile, but I did read somewhere and haven't watched it and I apologise, but didn't you play <laughs> a pregnant heroin addict in a film? Yeah, in a, t yeah, in a TV show in, called Time. That was my most recent thing. So I, 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 I would say lots of varied roles then. 
Yeah, a couple. Yeah? You played yeah. you played Mrs. Mormont, the scariest the scariest person in Game of Thrones for my money. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. You've got the zombie apocalypse last of us. Yeah. You've got the worst witch. Yep. Have you have you have you done some stuff where you are playing like a romantic comedy or or, or, or like a normal person? Uh whatever whatever normal not is. Really. I play I, okay. I guess the, the closest to normal I've played is I played uh Lorna Luft, Judy Garland's daughter in okay. that film Judy. Uh that's probably as close to normal as I've got. And is it is uh, this has got nothing to do with metaphobia, it's just interesting, right? But <laughs> and was that different to playing these kind of way out there parts, playing a normal person that actually lived? Yeah, it was more boring. Yeah. Um Playing normal people, it turns out, is uh, more boring. Unless, yeah. I mean, I think everybody, no matter how normal they are, has this like layer of complexity, but I wasn't really in it enough to be able to, for that to really be a thing. So we're not going to see you in Jane Austen anytime soon? I think it's pretty unlikely. <laughs> okay. And you t- never know. Do you, do you, do you think that... The kind of, the weirdness is not the right word, but the, the the strangeness of the characters that you that you get to play, mm-hmm. because they're completely different to a normal life. Do you think that helps get away from the metaphobic thoughts that you had, or or, or would yeah. they would the same have happened if you were playing Judy Garner's daughter? I think the same would have happened, honestly. But there's probably an element of it that being amplified when I'm playing someone very like different from me or in a circumstance that's very different like if I'm what's actually quite good is has been good is when I've been anxious then I've had to be in like a really adrenaline filled situation and it's sort of like done this weird thing in my brain where I've sort of sorted my anxiety out just by redirecting all of that fear into something else um yeah, sometimes it has the opposite effect though. Sometimes I'll be like trying to, I'll basically be, I'm, I won't be anxious and I'll be like inducing this fear in myself, this anxiety. And then after we cut, I'm like, oh, now I just feel terrible and right. anxious and now I'm scared. So it can happen both ways. Great. And um, for, for, for people that are watching that have a metaphobia, mm-hmm. I have to ask the question, you and I talked about this recently. You you said you are you're, you're completely over it. What what does that mean to you? It means uh, that this I don't. It's not controlling my life anymore. Like I don't think about sick, and I'm not scared. Of, I'm not actively trying to avoid it. Like every second of my life, um, I would say. Because we talked about the fact that <clears throat> is there's a difference between like a phobia and a fear. Like I would say yes. now, I'm just like maybe slightly. I create slightly more anxiety around it compared to a like a regular person, or I'm slightly more wary of it. But if it were to happen, I know that I'd cope. Like I know that it wouldn't be the end of the world, and that <clears throat> it would feel probably a bit new and scary if I were if I were to throw up, just because I haven't done for so long. But then I. would it would be fine, um, but it doesn't on a day to day basis. It's not there. It's it's not there the whole time in your mind. No, it doesn't control my decisions anymore, or my actions, or what I do, or what I think. Like it's just, it's just, yeah, it's just like not there. The, and I know, and I know that that's the case because of the stuff that I've been able to do since I've not had it anymore. Like my life is just like completely different like, to when I did have it. In what ways? In what ways is it different? Because big, big, you know, from the outside, mm. I can't see. I can't see what you're doing differently. Sure. So, so the flying example. I I now like okay. fly on planes on my own with without taking any sort of like tablets. I used to take uh, like a propanolol and Rennies and um, other things that. I thought would like stop me from being sick. And I used to take it every flight, no matter how long, whether I felt unwell or not. And now I just like get on a plane and 10 hours later I get to where I, I'm going and I've, I've not created any anxiety and I just, I'm just kind of chill, I'm just chilling. 
Like the idea of that, I never thought that would be something that I'd be able to do ever. Um, I've, I went on that train that I was afraid of going on. I've now been on that and I've traveled on it backwards, yep. which is like another extra thing. Um, I'll eat, I'll try new foods now. I would never do that. I'd only ever try new foods in like the safety of my own home. And even then I'd be nervous about it, but like I'll be out at a restaurant and there's something I've never had before and I'll try it, you know? stuff like that it's just i just don't have any limits on me anymore in terms of what i can and can't do depending on this phobia tell us about your journey from trying to overcome your metaphobia to the point where you overcame it i never really tried to overcome it for like a long period of time i never really gave my all to everything because i honestly didn't believe that anything would work like i just all these like self-help manuals that i had uh, or books that I'd read or or things that I'd tried, they were all like, I just knew reading them, like, I'm like, this just isn't going to, this just isn't going to work. I tried a couple of sessions of CBT, cognitive behavioral, cognitive behavioral therapy, and just didn't get on with it. I sort of knew what um, the therapist was going to say before he said it. Um, right. And hypnothera- I tried hypnotherapy for like a couple of sessions, just as something. I don't know. I just really, I just really struggled with it and didn't really try and get over it because I didn't. I knew that none of these things were going to help, so I just like didn't. How? <laughs> I just didn't how, really how, try. How, how did you know? What, what? What? How did? How could you look at those things and know that they're not going to cut it for you? Because it felt like none of them understood what it was like nobody really got it um yeah all these books i'd read and people that i spoke to like nobody yeah just nobody could like explain it to me in the way that it was like nobody knew what it was and that was obviously different when you when you found the thrive program the emetophobia yeah program for the thrive yeah i remember i was i was actually filming worth switch at the time when i first <clears throat> uh found out about it i think i was just like googling i was meant to be in tutoring uh, doing school and I was just googling like emetophobia cures uh, how to go over emetophobia because it was like driving me insane and yeah the Thrive program popped up and I was like hmm what is this this is interesting it seemed to like describe exactly what it was in a way that nothing I'd ever seen had before um, but I didn't get it it was like years after that I actually got the manual and did it for the first time because I think I was a bit, <laughs> I was then a bit afraid of the fact that I I think that I'd found something that was going to help me because then I'm like, I don't think I can, this phobia is like protecting me. I can't, I'm yeah. not ready to let go of that yet. So it, it took me a couple, of, a couple of years before I actually got the program and did it for the first time. And when, and from the time that you got it and did it for the first time to the time that you would, you would said you're over it, or let's say that was christmas last year right christmas 2023 how how long did it take you from start to finish i know you had to because you were scheduled everything else you were having to dip in and out of it but over what time period we're talking four or five years maybe five years but the reason that it was so long is because i did the uh kids and teenagers emetophobia manual okay and after that i felt like i was over it for maybe six months okay and then things started to come back and then I ended up with a full-blown phobia again. But it, I think it's because I didn't do it fully. Like I did it probably maybe 80%, which was great for the first six months. But then it, I didn't, hadn't implemented those things. It wasn't sustainable in, enough to, to last me because I hadn't done it 100%, you know? Like the adult man, manual, I probably just should have read from the beginning because I was, I was, I definitely could have done and I think it would have... Um, those extra things would have been really beneficial to me um so yeah and then I left it again for a while another few years of just having emetophobia and not really doing anything about it because I was too busy really and I was just doing so much and I didn't have didn't think I had time to sit down and really commit to the manual maybe wasn't ready again and then I did it and I did the adult version and I got (laughs) maybe two chapters in so many times because uh that's as far as I'd get and then I'd forget about it or I put the book down or maybe slightly intentionally forget about it um but yeah then I did it properly again maybe a year ago now and yeah probably a year ago now and yeah now it's I'm good I know that it's not like the first time where I'm like 
I'm not afraid of it coming back. Like, because I know that it coming back, it's not this thing. Like, I've created it. So I'm fully in control of whether I let myself create this phobia again for myself. And I, and I, I catch myself sometimes doing things like I won't eat this certain thing because I've had this thought. And I'm just very conscious to be like, nope, now I'm definitely going to eat the thing because uh, just to prove to myself that it's, that's just like the fear to I think that's the difference uh, that w- when we spoke for Christmas, then we spoke I don't know, a couple of months before that or something, the confidence you have now in... In, in the power that you have over this kind of mental health thing or what, whatever it is that's going on, you know that if you did wind yourself up into it again and you know create a bit of that phobia again, it wouldn't bother you mm. because you know you've got the skills to get over it. Yeah, exactly. So you're taking the power back. Yes, I definitely feel empowered around it. And I, because also when we spoke, first spoke about this, like I didn't know that I was over it. You're the one who said to me, it doesn't sound like you have a metaphobia anymore. Yeah, I'm like, huh, but because I was still really like probably a bit perfectionist and like focused in on the fact that well, when I start to feel sick, I still like create a lot of anxiety and I get really scared. Um, but it wasn't impacting my day to day life. It would only come up literally when I felt sick. And you're like, well, that's someone with a metaphobia doesn't can't do all the things that you've been doing. I think I think I said rather cruelly. If you told people right now that you had a metaphobia, <laughs> you'd get stoned. Yeah, you did say, say that. No, no, that you, yeah, yeah, there's nowhere near as bad. But that's that's one of the tricky things, isn't it? Because the emotions are so often catastrophized and there's a lot of black and white thinking and, th- and therefore even the tiniest bit of anxiety is perceived as a massive threat. And so you react to the massive threat. But when, when I said to you, I, it doesn't sound like you have it anymore. And, and we, I did that video on, you know, how will you know when you're over it sort of thing. Mm. Most people in the world don't want to be sick. Most people in the world would avoid it if they if they could do. You know, yes. it, I, I, would, I would, if I felt, if I felt ill now, I would rather go and lie down than just wait to be sick because it's an unpleasant thing. And when you realise that yours is reduced to, you know, kind of a normal response, it's like, oh, crikey, you know, I am over it. <laughs> um, a question for you. How... T- uh, um, the way the Thrive Programme works, as you know, we, we talk about uh, uh, phobias, particularly metaphobia, as a symptom of a person kind of mismanaging their mental health, right? Would you say yes. that fits perfectly for you? Yes, definitely. I think that every other, like, mental health well, not every other, but like a lot of my, well, basically all of my anxiety was linked to a metaphobia in one way or another. Um, so it all sort of traced back to this one symptom, which was this fear of being sick. But yeah, it was all because of my, yeah, you're right. It's all the other unhelpful thinking styles and all the stuff that you like learn about in the manual. I think that, yeah, it definitely like created this thing and created, I don't really know, I'm just sort of waffling now, but yes. Basically, that's good. So, have you noticed anything else that's changed, not directly related to that? Yeah, I would say I've just been, I've been generally like more able to like to do things, and I've learned to um, advocate for myself a bit more. And I've learned, I've, I've really my self esteem is one of the biggest things that I think the Thrive Program helped me with. It's just um from the very first time i did it when i was 14 15 or whenever it was um i think that really helped that and i just kind of can be kinder to myself i think that's the main difference and also in terms of like um my relationships with other people i feel like i have a like a better understanding of now if i react in a certain way i can then trace it back and be like oh that's why I did that because I know about the thinking styles and the biases and the all of that. I'm like, it just helps me. I think just self awareness. Like honestly, I think that impacts yeah. pretty much every area of your life if you can be self aware. In terms of a, a kind of overarching beliefs, mm. do you think you still have beliefs that are holding you back? Maybe not related to metaphobia, but beliefs generally, or do you think you've 
kind of tackled all of those? There probably are some that I'm maybe not as aware of, um, but I'd say the, the main ones have definitely gone. Like, they were all really emetophobia related. Those were all the yeah. things that were holding me back. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm sure. <laughs> I think it's unlikely that there'll be zero, but you know, who knows? Yeah. How, fun question. How, yeah. how much more powerful do you feel now in your life, now that you've, you've conquered this one big thing that was kind of, well, clearly wasn't holding you back. I've got a list of 30 <laughs> films here, right? Clearly, you know, you, you may have been stuck at home for a, a few weeks or a few months at one point, right? But it wasn't mm. holding you back work-wise. But then you've always been very focused and very determined. Yeah? yeah. You're a very driven person mm-hmm. and you take your responsibilities very seriously. Mm-hmm. But how much more powerful generally do you feel? You mentioned um, uh, self-advocacy a minute ago. You are seemingly more confident in interviews and things like this that, that when, when I see you on TV and see you on Jimmy Kimmel and mm. things like this. You know, you're a, you're a powerful force in those in those interviews. Yeah, and that's something that I think has definitely been helped by the Thrive Programme and also something that's just come with time um, Cut, and yeah. maturity and just being able to an experience. But I think that if I was still super like insecure and like afraid of uh, uh, how everyone was perceiving me and stuff, and I think I would be more, I definitely would be more shy. And I mean, I'm generally quite a shy person. Like I'm not... <laughs> I'm not someone who can like own a room. Uh, I don't feel like, yeah, like really like that. Like I'm still quite shy, but in a way that I'm comfortable in, like I'm not, I I don't want to be anything other than I am. Uh, But it's just about how can I just feel, yeah, the most empowered. And I do, I feel, and like I feel empowered now. So if I'm in a room that's too loud and too busy and too noisy, I'll just leave. I'll, I'll just leave for 10 minutes. I'll come back. It'll be fine. Like, I'm not afraid that people are going to, I'm not as afraid of people judging me now. I definitely was very afraid of that when I was younger, uh, when I still, especially when I had emetophobia. Uh, and I'm, I'm, that's definitely better now. So yeah, to answer your question, I definitely feel more empowered and have, and I feel like I can, um, I do feel like I can do anything if I put my mind to it. Like there's nothing like, why shouldn't I? That's sort of where I'm, where I'm at. I I would have to I would have to ever so slightly disagree with your comment about not holding a room. Because really? when I was looking back at some of the Yeah, yeah. As I was watching some of your recent interviews, you know, <laughs> and I'm sure people that watch this will, will have an opinion on it, you absolutely look like you're holding the room. You're not cocky, okay, mm. and you're not in your face, but you are you know you are holding that room. Mm. Well, you are in charge thanks. of that. It's really, it's 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 really lovely to see. Uh, right. So one final question. There are, as far as we can work out, about twelve million English speaking emetophobia sufferers in Oof. the UK, the states, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. What would you say to them? <laughs> I would say there is something that can help you. Um, you're not, you're, you're like, don't feel like your life is over because it's really not, um, I'd say look at the Thrive Programme, just like give it a go. You've not got anything to lose. Like if anything, you just like get your life back. Um, so I'd say that I'd also like practically get the Thrive Programme. Um, but also just like, there are so many people who have gone through it who are like proof that you can get over it and it seems like impossible if i had, was talking to myself back when i was like 14 and couldn't leave my house i'd be like yeah no way like that's definitely not a thing but but it is so i'd say um yeah i'd say you have a lot more power over your mind than you think you do one thing one thing that um springs to mind when you say that and one of the reasons why I think this video is going to be incredibly helpful for those people is that even though we've got hundreds of testimonials, 
the number of people that email in and think, ironically, they are just actors because mm. they feel so powerless. They don't, they don't believe there's thousands of people that have overcome their phobia. So you're the first real person a lot of a lot of these people will have seen mm. and you know you're you're a, you're a star right you, you know you're a real person you saying that you've overcome it i think will make a massive difference to some of those people that kind of just didn't believe some of the testimonials mm. and another thing with that as well is that i think there's a tendency and i definitely had this i i was like well it worked for all these other people but i'll be the one that it doesn't yeah work for like I know that that's gonna and that's fine, but I'll just yeah. I was like, I'm, I'm. It's not gonna work for me. Like I'm the anomaly. You're actually, you're actually not the anomaly. Like it's and the thing about the Thrive Program, which I love, it's like the Thrive Program teaches you how to make it work for yourself. Like it teaches you how your mind works. You're the one actually doing all the work. I'd say like the, the program actually just gives you all the all the information and the tools that you need and like the guidance. But it's actually all coming from you it's not this like thing that's just like this miracle cure it's actually you're doing all of the work um so if you really put your all into it then it's yeah it, there's no way that it like can't work i'd say so i say that okay i say that to people <laughs> How, mm. why do you say that I, I mean i know i know i know why but why do why do you feel that it can't not work because it's like logical and it's something that it's grounded in so much research and it just like reading through it, i'm like i don't know it just like teaches you how your brain works there's nothing about it that's like debatable there's nothing about it that's like opinion based either really it's all just it's kind of it's just logical and like scientific in a way that i really really appreciated when i was going through it Wonderful, 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 wonderful. I, I have a list of a thousand questions, but I'm going to stop you there because I know you're really, really busy. Thank you so much for taking the time today. I really appreciate it. And I know a lot of sufferers are going to really appreciate it. So I'll catch up with you at some point soon. But for now, Bella, thank you so, so much. Sounds good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'd like to thank Bella very much for taking the time out of her busy schedule to be with us today. But I want to reiterate one of the things she said. Most professionals, most doctors, most psychiatrists that have ever come across a metaphobia don't think it's possible to be cured of it, don't think it's possible to get over it completely. Well, we've got 20-odd thousand people over it now, including Bella Ramsey, and you really don't have to live with this, okay? So if you're suffering from this or you know someone that's suffering, get in touch and we'll help you. Thanks very much. Have a lovely day.